Okay. So the last thing we did, or what we didn't do from last week's slides are the last few on energy changes. And we're going to talk more about energy in another lecture. These few slides are just about energy changes in reactions. Okay. And every reaction has an energy change. It's either going to absorb energy or it's going to give off energy. An example of this is methane, natu our natural gas in our Bunsen burners, reacting with oxygen to give you a flame. Do you think this reaction is giving off energy or absorbing energy? Giving off giving off, right? So that's going to be your key. If you had this, how do you know this was giving off energy? It's hot, right? If you feel it, and it's hot to the touch, it's giving off energy. Okay? And we'll talk about this. The opposite is, if you touch something and it's cold, it's absorbing In these energy, in these reactions where energy is released, it's being released into the surroundings. If we're cooking something, it's being released from the methane into our food. Okay? So our food is absorbing that energy back in. Every change, every chemical change, every physical change, has an energy change that goes with it. And it can either be released or given off. We talked about a chemical reaction, conservation of mass. If you're in a lab and you start with five grams of reactants, you better have five grams of products at the end. Right? Same exact thing deals with energy. If you start with five units of energy, you better have five units of energy at the end. It may change forms, but energy does not get created or lost. Yeah. And this is the law of conservation of energy. Usually what happens in a reaction is you have something called chemical energy. It, there's energy in that methane. When you burn it, it gets released as heat. So it changed forms, but that same amount of energy is still there. And it's being released from the, from the mole methane molecules into the surroundings as heat. Okay. If we look at this in terms of a car, if we take octane, this is that the octane rating on, on gasoline, right? If you burn octane in a car, it gets converted from chemical energy into kinetic energy. It makes your car go. You didn't create energy, you didn't destroy energy. You just converted it from chemical energy into kinetic energy. Engines also get hot. So not only do you get kinetic energy, but you also get heat energy. So all you're doing is converting energy from one form into one or two other forms. In a chemical reaction, we can draw a graph showing this energy change. And in a later lecture, these graphs are going to get a little more a little bit more complicated. But at this point, it's just two types. On our x-axis, we have time. So we have the beginning, which is our reactant, and the end, which is our products. On the y-axis, is energy, with high energy at the top. So in this case, the reactants have more energy than the products. Would you say this is releasing energy or gaining energy? It's releasing energy. Products have less, meaning the energy went from our reaction into the surroundings. Okay? If energy is being released, we call this an exothermic reaction. In an exothermic reaction, this is like the methane burning. To us, it feels hot. Okay? If we touch, I touch this board, to the board, I am the surroundings. Okay? If I put my hand in that Bunsen burner flame, 
it is releasing that energy and my hand feels hot because I am absorbing that heat that was given off by it. So it seems a little strange, even though what I'm touching now has less energy, it feels hot. But that's because where it's going is into my hand. So an exothermic reaction to us feels hot. The opposite of an exothermic reaction is endothermic. Here, the reactants have lower energy than the products. Here, the, react the energy goes up. An endothermic reaction feels cold. I think, I think we'll do some of these in, in, in lab. Um, an example would be sometimes you may dissolve something in water and you notice the water gets cold. Okay? A cold, those instant cold packs, or, or an endothermic reaction. Generally, there's a little packet of something inside you have to bust open, then you mix it together, you have an endothermic reaction, it basically sucks the energy out of your hand when you touch it, which makes your hand feel cold. Okay. So it's taking the energy out of your hand and making its energy go up. Most chemical reactions are exothermic. And we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in a later lecture, why that is. At this point, you just need to know most reactions are exothermic. They release energy. This is hydrogen gas burning. You can't tell by looking at it. You don't know what you're looking at. This was a balloon filled with hydrogen gas. And they touched a match to it. So there's the match. There's a piece of the balloon and there's a piece of the balloon. This is hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas burning to give us water. This is very <coughs> endothermic. That's the Hindenburg blowing up. There's a lot of energy getting released. This is another reaction. That is probably an endothermic reaction. You're having to heat it. You're, you're taking the heat from the flame, putting it into the reaction to make it go. And we'll talk more about this is called the activation energy. That's a whole nother question. Okay. So that's the end of that section. There is one more type of reaction that we have to go over. And these are oxidation reduction reactions. In your book, they have their own chapter. Normally, this would be an entire lecture just on these, okay? These things are a pain in the butt if you really get into them. We're not going to really get into them, okay? So I have like five slides here, okay? So these are oxidation re reduction reactions. People call them redox reactions. Redox, redox. In an oxidation reduction reaction, electrons are transferred. If we have a double replacement reaction, all that really happens is they switch partners. The atoms switch around. In a redox reaction, the electrons move. So in this picture here, what's happening is this is a single replacement reaction. There's zinc in a copper solution. If you can see it, or if you can see it on your slides, there are this zinc here and there's copper. The copper and an ion, right? It's copper two plus. If you wanted to turn a copper ion into just copper, what would you have to do with its electrons? Would you have to give it electrons or take away? If you want to take copper to plus and turn it into just copper, a neutral copper, take away to, you have to give it to. So it started as oh, copper, okay. neutral. Copper, where is it? Copper. Where's copper? 23 11. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, there's copper. It lost two to get the two plus. If you want to get it back to neutral, you have to give it two. So what's going to happen is one of these zinc atoms is going to give it two. 
But when zinc gives away two, it now has a plus two charge. So it, the zinc, comes into solution as a zinc ion. Copper forms copper plating on the zinc strip. Okay. So when we do these single displacement reactions, this is what's going on. So we can see in our, in our reaction equation here, zinc here was neutral. Copper had a two plus charge. On this side, zinc has a two plus charge. Copper is now neutral. Electrons were transferred from the zinc to the copper. Does everybody see how that transfer of electrons changed the charge? So here it is again. We have the zinc. <coughs> The zinc is giving electrons to the copper. Electrons are coming out of our, our out of our zinc strip into the copper that's in solution. The copper then forms a plating on the zinc. Zinc comes off of the strip into solution. When this happens, we give names to these processes. The first one is oxidation. Oxidation means you lose one or more electrons. So, in this reaction, what was oxidized? Zinc or copper? The zinc. The zinc lost electrons. The opposite of oxidation is reduction. In that reaction, what was reduced? Reducing means you gain one or more electrons. The copper was reduced. We say the process of oxidation oxidizes the zinc. Reduction reduces the copper. You can never have one without the other. Because when something loses electrons, something has to gain them. So oxidation and reduction always happen as a pair. The way you remember which one is which, look at the charge. If the charge goes down, if I want to go from positive two to zero, did I gain or lose electrons? I gained. Did my charge go up or down? Down, right? If I gained electrons, was I oxidized or reduced? Reduced. So reduced makes the charge go down charge gets reduced, a smaller number. Okay. That's how I remember that. If the charge goes down, either from a positive number, say plus 2 to plus 1, that's reduced. From plus 1 to 0, it's reduced. From 0 to negative 1, that's a smaller number. It was reduced. Okay. I always find the thing that was reduced, and that means the other thing was oxidized. Thing, the element the charge goes up was oxidized, but there's no, to me, reduced, the number goes down. That's easy to remember. Oxidizing, meaning the number goes up, isn't easy for me to remember. If you can remember one, you can figure out the other one by process of elimination. So here is that same reaction in our full form, not just the ions. Okay. So here is our zinc. The zinc here has a zero charge, right? Copper had a plus two, chloride is minus one. Here, our <coughs> zinc is plus two, chloride is minus one, and our copper is zero. There's going to be some rules on how to assign these numbers, I think, on the next slide. But basically, it's just the charges. If I asked you what charge is a copper or a, a zinc ion, you would hopefully tell me plus two, and that's plus two. Copper, <coughs> plus two. What charge is a chloride ion? One. Minus one. So it's minus one. If you're not in an ionic compound, if you're just zinc or just copper, there's no charge in it. So it's zero. Okay. So you look at the numbers for each thing and look at what element had charge that went down. 
If I look on the left here, which element, zinc, copper, or chlorine, had a charge that went down from the left to the right? Zinc, <coughs> copper. Copper was plus two here, it's zero here. It went from plus two to zero, it was reduced. Zinc went from zero to plus two, it went up. So zinc was oxidized. Chlorine was negative one here, negative one there. It didn't have anything to do with this reaction. It was not oxidized, it was not reduced, it just kind of sat there. Would that still be called a single displacement? Yes. So uh, redox reactions can be can be some of our other ones, the other four types we had, synthesis, decomposition, single, double, or you can also have just a redox reaction. It doesn't fit into any of those. So what we did here, we assigned charges, but what we were actually doing was assigning what we call oxidation numbers. Okay. For us, it's basically going to be what charge would you normally give that element. For an ionic compound, the oxidation number is the same exact thing as the ion charge. That's what we were doing with the copper and the zinc and the chloride. We were just saying what charge is normally formed, that is that element's oxidation number. There is a big long list of rules on how to assign these. Okay? It's like 10 rules long. If you notice, uh, probably the next slide, I only gave you three of them, I think. Okay. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's a big, long thing. But where you get into all those little details is in complicated equations. We're not going to be dealing with complicated equations. The rules you need to remember is if you're in an uncombined element, like zinc in the, in the reactants, where it was just zinc, or in the products where we had just copper, oxidation number is zero. If it's just one element, it's zero. No questions asked. If you have a substance, a compound, NaCl, <coughs> if I have NaCl, what is the overall charge there? Zero. So if the oxidation numbers of the two elements in there have to equal zero. If I have something that has a negative, a net negative charge on it, say a, a nitrate ion, the oxidation numbers in them have to equal negative one. Okay. Normally here, you're going to be making them equal zero. So in sodium chloride, where's the oxidation number on sodium? Plus one. Plus one. What's the oxidation number on the chloride? Minus one. Minus one. Okay. Third rule, for us, the third is just what we're talking about. Look at the periodic table, like you always have, and tell me what charge would they normally form. Group one forms plus one. That's what it says. Group two forms plus two. You know that. Group 17 forms minus one. Just like you would do with charges. Okay? Use that to assign your oxidation numbers. Look at what element has an, has an oxidation number that goes down, it was reduced. The one that has an oxidation number that goes up was oxidized. You're done. Okay. What is the oxidation number of this magnesium? It's magnesium just by itself. So it's zero. So it's zero. <coughs> so if it's just one element, it's always zero. What is the oxidation number on the chlorine? Right. Chlorine is formed minus one. So, what is the overall charge on this? Is there a charge here? On CCO4, no. as a whole, is there a charge? No. No. There's no plus or minus here. So there's no charge, which means the oxidation numbers have to equal zero. 
and each chlorine is minus four, and there's four of them, what does the carbon have to be? Plus four. Plus four. Right. So we have CCl4. We say that. We write the numbers above it. Okay. That is a total four times negative one is negative four equals zero. And so whatever carbon is, minus four has to be zero. So carbon has to be plus four. So then you have plus four minus four equals zero. Yeah. So say like you were trying to balance an OH ion. And then it have like a negative, right? Would the other have like a negative one charge then? To make it balance? Yeah. So if you were just doing OH negative, <coughs> this is you're getting into the rules I deleted. But I will tell you, hydrogen is always plus one. And actually, I think there's a rule saying that oxygen is always minus two. So if you go minus two plus one, you actually get minus one. So can you repeat one more time, like with the fact that CCO equals zero? Why so, so the, the, the oxidation numbers of everything in it okay. added together have to equal whatever the overall charge is. And there is no charge here. There's no plus. So just because it doesn't show a plus or minus means it would have to equal zero. Right. No matter what. Oh, well, the four are obviously kind of. Right. So okay. because there's no charge, overall it has to equal zero. Okay. Chlorines are always minus one. So you start there. If there are four of them, so you have minus four, okay. carbon can have multiple oxidation numbers. But by process of elimination, if it has to equal zero, that carbon has to be plus four. Yes? Okay. So if it says the sign oxidation numbers for each element, would you say the oxidation number that corresponds to chlorine is negative four or negative one? Really good question. No, it's, it's the minus one. Okay. It's ignore the fact that there's four of them. So just say each chlorine is minus one. So either way, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where the four is there or not, it'll still have to equal zero anyway, so if it's... Right, so say you had CCL, that wouldn't actually exist. But, but what would well, the carbon have to be here? Positive, positive one. one. Okay, got it. Yeah? So the answer number two would be that carbon has a plus four and the chlorine has a negative one? Yes. Yes. And if that was on a quiz or something, I would write it above. That's how you do it. You write the little oxidation numbers above the element. So what is the oxidation number of the chlorine in NaCl? Negative one. How about the sodium? Plus one. Easy enough? Wait, what was NaCl again? I'm sorry. Good. Chlorine is always minus one. one sodium is always plus one. So it's, so it's zero, zero which, which makes sense because there's no charge here. Got it. Okay. One more thing. I don't know why it wasn't in here. Maybe I deleted an accident. But let's go back. So this is where you're going to take me. Okay. It's not hard, it's just confusing. Okay. It's no it's naming and I can't do anything other than tell you what it is and to help you understand it. Okay. In this reaction, what was oxidized? Zinc. And the copper was reduced. We can name things oxidizing agents and reducing agents. And where it gets confusing is the thing that gets reduced is the oxidizing agent because it oxidized the other thing. The thing that gets oxidized is the reducing agent because it reduces the other thing. Write it down, you will see that. I don't, I don't know why it's not in this slide. I think it gets mentioned. Is it somewhere and I, I overlooked it? I think I 
So the element, if the charge goes down, it's reduced, which means it's the oxidizing agent. If the charge goes up, it's oxidized, which means it's the reducing agent. Okay? It seems backwards. The way I think of it is, if you have a cleaning agent, like Mr. Clean or Pine Saw, it doesn't clean itself, it cleans the floor. The cleaning agent cleans something else. So the reducing agent reduces something else, if that makes any sense to you. Just remember it's backwards, okay? So if you had this, this problem, the question, a very likely question would be, what is the reducing agent in this reaction? What is it? Uh, zinc. 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 Oxidized, it goes from zero to plus two, which means it is the reducing agent. It gave its electrons to the copper and reduced it. <coughs> Make sense? So you're not going to be tested on these last couple of slides. This is just why we care about redox reactions. Rusting is a redox reaction. So here is our iron, okay? And we have a water droplet forming on it, okay? Iron, metal, gives electron to oxygen. And when that happens, you form an iron ion. Iron ion is soluble in water. So it dissolves in your water and runs away, which is why the car rusts away. It turns from iron into iron oxide, which is somewhat soluble, and so you partially dissolves in the water and your car disappears. Same exact thing that happens with copper and brass, where you get that that green tarnish on it, or with silver jewelry, where you get the, the, the uh, gray tarnish. It's an oxidation reduction reaction. Okay. Does anyone have an outboard motor? A what? You no. do. Have you ever noticed the little sacrificial anodes on there? So. There's these little zinc plates. This is a giant ship, so your oh, plates would look. Yeah, usually yeah. usually yeah. on the, the lower unit of your outboard, mm -hmm. there'll be a little, how big is your outboard? That's a piece of paper. Okay, so it's probably be pretty big. So it's probably about that long, mm -hmm. about that tall, just above the, uh, so it's just, just above the plot, there's the, not the hydroplane, I can't think of the, just the fin, just above the prop. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually just above that, I have a 150 mercury. So it's just above that, and one on each side, there are two little zinc plates. And what that is, is your motor is made up of probably steel. Steel will rust. But what happens is zinc rusts easier. Okay? So instead of your motor rusting, zinc Rust. Let me take that back. I take this. No, I do take this. The, the water takes electrons from your steel, but then the steel takes electrons from the zinc. So then your, your steel never actually loses electrons. It's called a sacrificial anode. If you're ever in by a big port and you look at big tankers and things, they have them all over the ship. Okay? Because eventually all that zinc will disappear and they just pull it off and stick a new one on. Same, they do the same thing with big oil pipelines. 
the oil pipelines will rust. You get a hole and you got a giant fissure, right? So you put zinc plates on them, and every once in a while you go replace the zinc plates. The zinc plates rust away instead of your steel pipe. You can also put paint. If you put paint things, rust oleum, it keeps it from rusting. That prevents the oxygen in the air from contacting your metal. If the two don't come together, they can't chain, they can't trade electrons. You also do something similar when you electroplate metal. And yes, that's a gold <coughs> DeLorean. <laughs> so what happens is you take a metal and you plate it with another metal that's one of, on the higher on that activity series that corrodes more slowly. What happens basically you hook, say, say you want to electroplate this ring, you hook it up to an electric charge, and if it is on the negative electrode, that, that ring now has a negative charge. If you have gold ions in solution, they have a positive charge. So you get an attraction, positive ions come to the negative charged ring, and you get a gold ring. And so when the gold touches the ring, electrons from, say, it's silver underneath, get transferred from the <coughs> silver into the gold. So a little bit of your silver ring goes into solution, and the gold comes out of solution, forming a coating. So that's the end of that. So on yours, I just combined the two. I have them in separate files. <coughs> Any questions with redox reactions? What you would be required to do is assign oxidation numbers, tell me what was reduced, what was oxidized, what was the reducing agent? What was the oxidizing agent? Okay. The most of the reactions that you're going to be dealing with are simple with ions. None of this carbon oxygen stuff. Okay. Then it gets complicated. So now we move on. Okay. This is dimensional analysis at its finest or worst, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. This is the stoichiometry that I mentioned. When I said stoichiometry last time, a lot of people laughed. And I don't know if you were laughing at the name or if you knew what that was and you were not looking forward to it. Okay. That one? Okay. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the quantities in chemical reactions. So if we have a balanced equation, we know what the products come together to make in reactants, sorry, what the reactants come together to make in products. We know how it's balanced, but we need to take this into the real world in grams. Because you can't go to a balance in the lab and weigh out five moles of sodium chloride. The balance goes in grams. And you need to know, if I start with five grams of sodium chloride, how much of my product am I going to make? Because okay. if you know your product is going to make three moles, sorry, you're going to make three moles of your product, how much is that? If you have three moles of hydrogen gas, that's not very much. But if you have three moles of lead, that's a lot. So you need to be able to work in grams, because grams mean something to us, moles don't. So in order to use this, we have to think about what a balanced equation means. This is the burning of propane. Here's propane, and then there's oxygen floating around. If you look at this, what can you tell me about what you get out of this reaction? Here's the here's it written out at the bottom. You take one protein, propane, Mix it with five oxygens, you get three CO2s and four waters. Look at this and tell me how these numbers <coughs> down here correlate to the picture. So there's how many propanes are here? One. one. How many propanes are here? There's one propane molecule, right? Here there's five oxygens. How many oxygen molecules are there here? Five. 
says we get three of three CO2s. How many CO2 molecules are here? Three. Four waters. How many water molecules are here? Four. So what do the coefficients on these mean? How many molecules? That's one level that we can look at this. We can say that this balanced equation tells us that one propane molecule reacts with five oxygen molecules to give us three CO2 molecules and four water molecules. And you are completely correct in saying that. But we can also extend that, and it actually works the same exact way in moles. We can say one mole of propane reacts with five moles of oxygen <coughs> to give three moles of carbon dioxide and four moles of water. It's the same exact thing, it's just you're either working in molecules or moles. So the coefficients tell us the relative number. We can, de we, we can determine what that relative number refers to, either molecules or moles. That's, that's exactly what we're talking about. But you know, also, like you said, here the coefficients are applying to moles. Here's the same reaction. Look at applying this in different ways. Okay? We said one molecule, five molecules. If we start with two molecules of propane, we can say there are five times as many molecules of oxygen as there are propane. So if we start with two molecules of propane, we have 10 of the oxygen, giving us 6 of CO2 and 8 of the waters. These coefficients tell us ratios. Okay? So that means for every one of these, you need 5 of those. So if you have 2 of these, you need 10 of those. Does everybody see that? how that ratio works? Okay. Same way, if you have 100 of these, you need 500 of these, you get 300 and 400. This, let's, let's skip the molecules when it comes down to the moles. We can just change it, like I said, from molecules to moles. So one mole, you react with five moles of oxygen, you get three moles of CO2, four moles of water. If we convert these back into molecules, from moles to molecules, using, using Avogadro's number, that means 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of these reacts with five times that many of oxygen. Okay. So that ratio always stays the same whether you're working in molecules or moles. When we start doing comparisons of amounts of one thing in a reaction to another, we call it this weird word stoichiometry. And I have no idea where that word came from. So look it up before you ask me, because I don't know. <coughs> you probably can't read it. It says, Frustrated Chemistry Students in 1792. Yeah, 1792. Okay. Stoichiometry does not have to be hard. Okay. It is going to more or less be filling in the blank and then doing the math with dimensional analysis. Okay. It's a matter of finding where you're starting, where you're trying to get to, filling in the blanks in between and doing the math. Okay. If you're struggling with it, you're probably making it harder than it has to be. <clears throat> okay. There are multiple kinds of stoichiometry problems. And we're going to keep coming back to this flowchart. Okay? Get in your head grams of A, moles of A, moles of B, grams of B. Okay? You can start anywhere on this flowchart and go to the right. If you start with grams of A, you can use that to figure out moles of A, moles of B, or grams of B. Okay? If you start with moles of A, you can use it to find moles of B to grams of B, or grams of B. So if you find a problem, you figure out where you're starting, where you're ending, and do the math. And the math is always going to be the same, no matter what stoichiometry problem you're doing. There is no hard problem, 
versus the easy problem. They're all the same difficulty once you figure out where you're starting and where you're ending. So we can go mold to mold, just this step. We can go grams to mold through here. We can go moles to grams, or the big one, grams to grams. We do this using what we call a mole ratio. And all a mole ratio is, is the coefficients. If you were going to say, what is the ratio between the molecules of <coughs> oxygen that react to the moles of propane that react? What is that ratio? Yeah, so either one to five or five to one, however you look at it. There are five oxygens for every one propane. That is your mole ratio. The mole ratios come directly from the coefficient. What is the mole ratio between oxygen, or sorry, water and CO2? Four to three. There are four waters for every three CO2s. That's all the difficult it is. So the mole ratio of oxygen to propane allows us to calculate, if we are starting with this much propane, how much oxygen do we need to react with it? And we just use the mole ratio to figure that out. And so if we're going to start with 0 0.40 moles of propane, H8, I want to convert this to moles of oxygen. It's dimensional analysis, so my units have to cancel. So if that's my unit here, what's my unit here? Moles of propane. Three H eight. I'm trying to get to moles of oxygen. So I'm going to put moles of oxygen here. I just have to figure out what numbers go here. This is where my mole ratio comes comes in. How many what's the coefficient on oxygen? Five. Five. I just put a five here. What's the coefficient on propane? One. I put a one there. <coughs> That's my stoichiometry. It's a moles to moles problem. It's just one step. 0.4 times 5 equals 2. Here's a, a similar but different problem. So the first question is asking, what is the mole ratio between oxygen and benzene? Yeah. I would say 15 to 2. But as long as you know what you what you mean when you say that, it's, it's fine. So the mole ratio is there are 15 oxygens for every two benzene. First, the next question is how many moles of oxygen are required to react with each mole of benzene? How many do you think? Can you do that in your head? 15. No, it's not 15. 7.5. There's 15 for every two. If you have one, you have half of that. So 7.5. So let's do that with the dimensional analysis. So we're starting with one mole of C6. H6, I have to have moles of C6H6 here. We're trying to get the oxygen. So I'll put moles of oxygen there. Just put my coefficients in. Oxygen is 15. Benzene is 2. If you do that math, you're going to get 7.5. So if we were to do it's the same problem, it's just 0.38 instead of 1. So since I have, have, already have it set up, I can, instead of starting at 1, I can say 0 0.38. <coughs> do the math, and that's it. Okay. 
another one. What's the ratio between CO2 and oxygen in this one? <clears throat> right. You get three CO2s for every five oxygens that react. So, and the question is, if you have react, 2.3 moles of oxygen, how many moles of CO2 will you get? So we start with 2.3 moles of oxygen, dimensional analysis, so I have to have moles of O2 here. I'm trying to get to moles of CO2. I just plug in my coefficient. CO2 is 3, oxygen is 5. I do the math and I'm done. Everybody see it? It's the same exact thing we did before, it's just before we were going between two things on the left. Here we have one thing on the left, one thing on the right. It doesn't matter what side it's on. Just take the coefficient. Another one. Aluminum reacting with chlorine. So how many moles of chlorine are required to prepare 6.2 moles of aluminum chloride? It's the same math. In the other one, we were given how much reactant and trying to figure out how much product we were going to make. Here, we know we want to make 0.62 moles of product. How much of the reactant do we need? The math is exactly the same. So I start with 0 0.62 moles of aluminum chloride. That same unit comes down here. <coughs> Where am I going to? Moles of Cl2. I put in my coefficient. Cl2 is 3. ALCL3 is 2. And I do my math. Yeah. Does everybody feel comfortable with moles to moles? All you do is multiply it by your mole ratio. Okay. The next step is to start one step further to the left. So instead of going moles of A to moles of B, we're going to start over here at grams of A to go moles of A to moles of B. So, looking at that, what would you say is my starting point? 80 grams of oxygen. This is going to be a little bit longer, so I'm going to start over. 80 grams of oxygen is my starting point. So we're using dimensional analysis, so I know what my next unit is. Grams of oxygen has to be there. If I want to go from grams of A to moles of B, I have to go through moles of A. So if I want to convert 80 grams of oxygen to moles of oxygen, how do I do that? Right. So with units, I can go grams of oxygen here to moles of oxygen. One mole of O2 weighs 32. Each oxygen is 16, so O2 is 32. One mole of oxygen weighs 32 grams. So now my grams can. Now I'm at moles of O2, which is my moles of A. So I want to go from moles of A to moles of B. So here I have moles of O2. So this has to be moles of O2. What is my end point? What is my end unit? Right. Moles of KClO3. So I'm going to go here, moles of KClO3. 
oh, 03. What numbers do I put here? Uh, you put two on the top of Yes. So it's just that, that mole ratio that we were doing before. 2 KClO3, that's the coefficient. The coefficient of oxygen is 3. My moles of oxygen cancel. I'm left with moles of KClO3. Right. This part, this and this, is the same exact math we were doing. We just added this step to it. Because we had to get, we started at grams, so we had to get to moles before we could do the mole ratio. Remember, these coefficients don't apply to mass. This does not mean 2 grams of KCLO3 will give 2 grams of KCO and 3 grams of oxygen. Mass is completely independent of that. This is number of molecules, either measured in molecules or measured in moles. So, here is moles to grams. This was grams of A to moles of B. This problem is moles of A to grams of B. It's the same math, you're just going to do it in a slightly different order. So look at that problem. What is my starting point? One point five zero moles of KCLO3. Did everybody see where that starting point came from? Is it, is it clear to you why that's a starting point? Where the A and the B coming from? So A is just A is just the thing that you're starting with. In this case, we're given a number of KCLO3. And so we say that is our A. And we're going to something else, so we say that is our B. And so no, we're only given one number in this problem. It's 1.5 moles of KCLO3, trying to figure out how many grams of oxygen that gives us. Okay. So our B is O2. A is KCLO3, B is O2. What we're starting from and what we're going to. So we're starting at 1.5 moles of KCLO3. That's the only number we're given, so that's where we have to start. And so we're trying to get to grams of O2. So here's my starting. That same unit has to be here. If I'm going from moles of KCLO3 to oxygen, I have to go through moles of oxygen. On that flow chart, it goes moles of A, moles of B, grams of B. We're trying to get the grams of B all the way on the right hand side. So how can I go from moles of KCLO3 to moles of oxygen? Mole ratio. Right. I can go moles of oxygen, do the mole ratio. Oxygen is three, this is two. That unit cancels. That unit comes down here. I now have moles of oxygen. I have to get it to grams of oxygen. And so it's just the molar mass of O2. One mole weighs 32 grams. just do. It's 
just stringing it all together. So, look at that problem. So where am I starting? 9.2 grams of sodium. We're supposed to figure out if we're going to start with 9.2 grams of sodium, how much chlorine gas do we need to give it to react? So 9.20 grams of sodium. This is my moles of A. Sorry, sorry, grams of A. This is my grams of A. After grams of A, we go to moles of A. I have to convert this to moles of sodium. I cancel my units. Grams become what? Moles. Moles. Moles of sodium. What number goes here? Two. Or one. Here is just one. Because here we're not doing the, the mole ratio yet. We're just stick with sodium. Uh, okay. So we're going to say one mole of sodium weighs 20. mm -hmm. 23. So that we take our mass, divide by our molar mass to get how many moles we have. So now we have moles of sodium. I know moles of sodium comes here. Our next step in our flow chart is moles of A to moles of B. So what is my unit here? Moles of Cl2. Yes. Moles of Cl2. What number goes here? One. And what number goes here? Two. That's our mole ratio. Those are our coefficients. The coefficient of Cl2 is one. Coefficient on sodium is 2. So I have moles of chlorine that has to come down here. I go from moles of B to grams of B. What is my unit here? Grams of Cl2. What number goes here? 1 mole of Cl2 weighs 71. And that's it. Is there anyone who's, we haven't been actually doing this math. Is there anyone who is not comfortable going from this and doing the math? You multiply everything on top to get a number. Multiply everything on the bottom to get another number. Then you take the top, divide it by the bottom. Everybody's comfortable with that? Okay. So do you see how this is the hardest Stoichiometry problem you can do. Grams to grams. Each step is very straightforward and sort of intuitive. The only thing that may not be intuitive is the mole ratio. And if you can remember, take the coefficients, you're golden. Okay? So just remember moles of A, sorry, grams of A, moles of A, moles of B, grams of B. Figure out where you start, figure out where you end and do whatever math you need to do, whatever math the dimensional analysis tells you you need to do to get from where you're starting to where you're ending. The moles are only focused on the coefficients, correct? <coughs> well, besides if you're trying to convert it to like one mole, but like... Right. So if you're going from mole, when you're at the moles of A to moles of B step, you then use... Then like one mole is converted to the, right. the coefficient there. So when you're, when you're going from grams to moles, your conversion factor is how much one mole weighs. And then so that's where the grams come in, like the, mole, the grams is going to be like the mass. Right. Okay. So to go from grams to moles, you have to have a conversion factor. And our conversion factor is one mole weighs 23 grams. Here, our conversion factor to go from moles of chlorine to grams is one mole weighs 71 grams. That's our conversion factor. Our conversion factor to go from moles of sodium to moles of chlorine is our mole ratio, our coefficients. They tell us our conversion factor.
here is giving us two numbers. And I believe in this one it actually works out nice. And, but we'll see what happens later when it doesn't work out nice. So we're reacting 9.2 grams of sodium with 14.2 grams of chlorine. So if you did that math that we had up here, it comes out to be 14.2. Okay. So now the question is, if you take your 9.2 grams of sodium and the 14.2 grams of chlorine, mix them together, what mass of NaCl will you get? It's the same exact problem, the only difference, instead of going sodium to chlorine, You'll be going either sodium or chlorine, you can pick one, and go to sodium chloride. So, how many pick one? You want to start with sodium or chlorine? chlorine. Start with chlorine. So, we're going to start at 14.2 grams of chlorine. I go from grams of chlorine to what? Moles. Moles, Moles of chlorine. So, grams of chlorine goes there. Moles of chlorine goes there. What's my number here? One. My number here? <coughs> 71. I go from moles of chlorine to what? Um, moles of NaCl. Right. Moles of, of NaCl. So moles of chlorine goes here. Moles of sodium chloride goes there. What number is here? Two. Two. That's the coefficient on NaCl. And what number is here? One. One. The coefficient on chlorine. So now I go from moles of NaCl to what? Grams of NaCl. My moles come down here. What number goes here? One. NaCl weighs 58 something. Just because I say 58. Same exact type of math. You just substitute it based on where you were starting and where you're ending the numbers that you plugged in. Um, lost? Like, I just. Then, uh, what is the 9? Does the 9.2 not matter? In this case, no, it does not. So you could just pick one. So basically, when you say pick one, you're not basically substituting the grams. No. So in this case, the previous problem was, if you start with this, how much of the chlorine do you need? And we calculated 14.2. So we know that this amount exactly reacts with that amount. So no matter which one you start with, you're going to give the same amount of product. So we just picked one. We picked chlorine. And where did you get the 58 from? Is that just like whatever Na and That's NaCl. Okay. Yeah. Other than this situation, you're not going to be able to just pick one. Okay. It may be in the next slide that we get to something called limiting reactants, where you have to figure out which one is the one that matters. Last thing. Here's a big one. Another mass to mass. Somebody want to come up and do this. Here's a big, the math, remember, there is no hard and easy stoichiometry problem. So this is gram to grams, so this is no harder than the one we just did. It just looks hard because we're going to have huge numbers. That's a lot of hydrogen, right? <laughs> this is the space shuttle taking off. Okay. <coughs> Somebody want to do this? Okay. If you can get yourself up here. Okay. So what is our starting point? 
and then that 1.8 times 10 to the 8 grams of hydrogen gas. And what are we trying to get to? Let's, let's do number one first. O2. Grams of oxygen. Grams of O2. Yes. So in, in problem one, we're going from grams of hydrogen to grams of O2. Let me do this. It may be on the next slide. Uh, maybe I'll just look it up. No. It's not there. Somebody want to come up and do number two? Is that anything It's the same Dang. problem. It's just if you're going to go from hydrogen to water instead of hydrogen to oxygen. It's the same math. I'll try. Go for it. But just do it under under here because number three is going to ask us to compare the two. So what are you, you're starting at the same point. Yeah. Oh, you're adding, got it. There you go. Okay. So somebody want 
do that math for her. So that is number two. So as you figured out, if you combine 1.8 times 10 to the 8 grams of hydrogen with 1.4 billion grams of oxygen, you get 1.62 billion grams of water. Okay. The third part is, do the mass of the water vapor, which is our product, equal the the total mass of our reactants. So it's the 1.4 times 10 to the 9 plus 1.8 times 10 to the 8. Does that equal 1.62 times 10 to the 9? <clears throat> yeah, that makes, I can see it's going to be very close. It's basically the same. It's just we rounded so here, so it doesn't come up the exact way. Okay. So if you take this this many grams of oxygen, combine it with this many grams of hydrogen, it's conservation of mass. That's the law that we're talking about. The law of conservation of mass. You can't destroy it. You can't make it. Everything that was on the left is now in water. There's nothing else on the right. So all of the mass that you started with has to be in water. And so, we showed that. We calculated how much oxygen reacts with that much hydrogen, and then we independently calculated how much water we would make, and then we went back and checked it by adding our two reactants together to look at our product in a match. Want to do another one, or you want to move on? Is, is, is everyone comfortable in doing this? For now. For now, okay. <laughs> Do you think it's about more. Thursday? <laughs> well, let's, let's see what it's about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the next thing is limiting reactants, so we're going to take a break. If anyone wants to go over that, that one we skipped, let me know and we can go over it over break. Okay? So we will come back and we will start at 7.40 on this clock. We do a little, a little more than 15 minutes.
Reaction. We got lucky because we had two, two amounts of starting reactants and they both equally mashed and gave the same amount of power. That usually is not the case. Okay. Either through weighing errors or later on we'll see why you would want to do this, but you may purposely use way too much of one reactant. Okay. When that happens, you have to figure out how much product you're going to get. And we call that the limiting reactant. You mix two reactants, one of them, there isn't going to be enough of to completely react with, react with the other one. So we say that one limits how much product you can make. It, it limits how far the reaction can go. That is your limiting reactant. So eventually we're going to do this in numbers. But we'll first take a look, take a look at the picture. This is hydrochloric acid, and we're dropping in magnesium. Okay. You get a reaction going. There, there, there's the reaction at the first, lots of bubbles. There, after a while, your reaction looks like this. And then at the end, you're left with that. Looking at those pictures, can you tell me which reactant ran out, and which one would you say is in excess, meaning there's more than you need? Well, you ran out and then you can mess up. Can you see? See So, oh, I was looking at this wrong. <laughs> this is not a timeline. Okay, yeah, sorry, okay. I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. It's not a timeline. Well, it, it looks like a timeline, but when you yeah. look at what the problem is, it's not a timeline. Okay. So this is the reaction happening. Okay. In this one, the reaction has stopped. One of the reactants ran out. Which one would you say was the limiting reactant? The magnesium metal or the hydrochloric acid? Hydrochloric acid. Why? Magnesium is still there. Right. You can see that there's magnesium metal there. So certainly that one didn't run out, which means what you ran out of was the hydrochloric acid that you can't see. In this one, the reaction is finished. In that one, which one was limiting? Magnesium. The magnesium. It's completely gone. You ran out of it. Magnesium was your limiting reactant. The hydrochloric acid was in excess. Sorry? I didn't see the metal at the bottom. Oh. <laughs> you see it now? <laughs> Whenever you do a reaction, you're going to have one of the reactants is going to be left over, one is going to completely disappear. The one that disappears is the limiting reactant. Because that is the one that completely that runs out, that is the one that determines how much of your product you're going to get. Okay? Here's a, a, this nail reaction again. So it's either nail in a copper solution. Looking at the solution, what would you say is the limiting reactant? The copper or the iron? The copper. The copper. The nail is still there, right? You ran out of copper. You can think of this <coughs> as a recipe. A chemical equation is just like a recipe. 
you need two of this or three of this to make five of these. Okay? So if you're going to make pancakes, if you're going to make 16 pancakes, you need all of this. Right? If you don't have all of that, you cannot make 16 pancakes unless you don't want your pancakes to taste good. <laughs> so, what would happen? You have your recipe card. It says it makes 16 pancakes. If you look in your refrigerator and you only have one egg, because egg is always what you're missing, right? So, if you only have one egg, how many pancakes can you make? Eight. Eight. That is completely intuitive to you, right? It's the same exact thing in a chemical reaction. If you need two hydrogens to make 16 waters, and you only have one hydrogen, how many waters can you make? Eight. <laughs> okay. If you only have one egg, how many cups of flour do you need? One and a half. It makes total sense to you. Right? Don't make it any harder than that when you go from recipes to chemical equations. If you need two hydrogens and three oxygens to make five waters and you only have one hydrogen, how many oxygens do you need? One and a half. Okay. Another example. You want to make a model car. You have kits that come with lots of different parts. To make a car, you have to have a body. It's a solar-powered car. You need a solar-powered a solar cell, the electric motor, and four wheels. If you have all of those things, you can make a whole car. If you have these parts, how many cars can you make? Three. <laughs> you can make three. You have the bodies to make four. You have the solar panels to make five. You have the motors to make six. But you only have three sets of wheels. This one's got three wheels. Yes, you could. <laughs> In a car, you can change it around. If you're trying to make a compound, if your boss tells you, I want you to make this, and you say, well, I don't have this, I'm going to make it this, it's not going to go over very well. So you can only make three cars, because you only have three sets of these. Okay. Let's move back into our realm. Okay. Here we're reacting hydrogen gas with oxygen gas to make water. Here is what we're starting with. What is the limiting reactant and what is in excess? I hear both. Because there's only one oxygen. There's only two. There's two. There are, there are three, three oxygens. Oh. There are three oxygens. The red needs three oxygens. The white ones are hydrogens. So in your, res in your recipe, you need two hydrogens and one oxygen, right? So you need twice as many hydrogens as oxygens. So the way I would do this is I would look at this and say, which one of these has the fewest of them? That's the easiest to count. Okay. So I would count there are three oxygens, which means I need how many hydrogens? Six. six, twice as many. So then you figure out, are there at least six? One, two, three, five. four, five, six, seven, eight. I only need six, I have eight of them. So hydrogen is in excess, which means oxygen is the limiting reactant. Yeah? I'm guessing it might be the next slide. Can you do it without the picture? You would have to be given a number saying you have this many moles of this okay. or this many grams of this type of thing. Okay. You can't just be given an equation and say which one's limiting. That's what I was trying to do. No, you, you, you can't do that. Okay. Because this balanced equation, there, in a balanced equation, there is no limiting reactant. This is a perfect oh, world okay. where everything it completely comes matches together. In a real world, things don't completely come together. So there are two ways 
you can do problems like this once you get into the math portion of it with numbers. Okay. In one case, you can say if I have X amount of reactant A, how much of reactant B do I need to react with it? If I have at least that much, then A is limiting. That's what we did here. We said we're starting with three oxygens. I need six hydrogens to react with it. I have eight of them, so the oxygen is limited. That is one way of doing it. So I could do, say I told you you have one gram of hydrogen, five grams of oxygen. You would do stoichiometry to figure out how many grams of oxygen you need to react with one gram of hydrogen. If you calculate you need four grams and you have five, hydrogen is limited. If you calculate you need six and you have five, oxygen is limited. That's one tactic to do it. The other way is to calculate how much product each one will make. If I have one gram of hydrogen, how much water will I make? If I have five grams of oxygen, how much water will I make? Whichever one makes the lowest amount of water, that's your limiting reactant. So that is what we just said. So calculate how much reactant B you need to react with how much A you have, and figure out what that means to you. Or number three, calculate how much product each one gives you and take the smallest one. Okay. And you'll get used to figuring out which one of these is easier. If the problem is to figure out which one is limiting reactant, this one requires one stoichiometry problem, A to B. This way, you have to do two stoichiometry problems. You have to figure how much product from A and how much product from B. That's twice as much work. If the product, if the question is just asking which is the limiting reactant, I want to do as little work as possible. So I'm going to do this. But most of the time, the question will have two parts. A, what is the limiting reactant? And B, how much product does it make? So if you do it this way, to figure out the limiting reactant, you already know how much product it's going to make. It's the smaller one of them. So then you just copy that number from A down to B. Okay, and we'll, we'll see this. So here is an example. Here's our reaction, phosphorus reacting with oxygen to give us what? Diphosphorus pentoxide, not P4O10. That's, that's what Google tells you. This is P2O5. Okay, so here's an example. We're mixing half a mole of P4 and five moles of oxygen. Before we do it on the board, see if you can do this in your head. I would compare one reactant to another rather than figuring out the whole product method. Okay, so we have half a mole of P4. If we have half a mole of T4, how much oxygen do we need? 2.5. We need five times as many moles of oxygen as we have phosphorus. We're starting with 0.5, so we need five times that much, which is 2.5. We have five moles. So what is our limiting reactant? The phosphorus. The phosphorus. The phosphorus. Right. So there you did it in your head. So let's do it up here. You can do this starting at either the 0.5 phosphorus or the 5 moles of oxygen. It doesn't matter to me. The 0.5 moles of phosphorus is the first one, so I'm going to start there. Neither one is more easier, more easy, or difficult. So we have 0.50 moles of phosphorus. All we need to do is use our our mole ratio to go from moles of phosphorus to four to moles of oxygen. What, no, what number goes here? Five. Five and one. That's the exact same math we did in our head. 0. 0.5 times five equals 
moles of oxygen. We need 2.5, we have five. There's plenty of oxygen to go around, which means a phosphorus must be the limiting reactant. What if we start with 0.2 moles of phosphorus? We have one mole. It's neutral. It comes out equal. If we put 0.2 in here, 0.2 times 5 equals 1. We need one mole of oxygen to react with 0.2 moles of phosphorus. So in this case, it is completely balanced. Neither one of them is limited. What if we have 0.25 moles of phosphorus and 0.75 of the oxygen? Oxygen is limited. Plug in 0.25 here, we're going to get 1.25 here. We need 1.25, but we only have 0.75. So 0.75, I'm oh sorry, oxygen is our limiting reactant. Follow? Would you need to solve uh, C D out of phosphorus? Or just because it's oxygen is the limiting, you don't need to know what, how many moles of phosphorus <coughs> you don't need to. The, the, all the question is asking what is the limiting reactant? So we can fig we can figure that out based on the math we did. So we don't have to know. <coughs> so that's what we did. There's another one. Here's a reactant. We have two moles of nitrogen, five moles of hydrogen. What is limit? If you have two moles of nitrogen, how many moles of hydrogen do you have to have? Yeah. <coughs> no. If you, if you have two moles of nitrogen, oh, okay. based on the equation, Six. how many moles of hydrogen do you have to have? Six. Six. Two, and you need three times as much hydrogen as nitrogen, so you need six. You only have five. So what is the limit? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. So let's do it up here. If 2.0 moles of nitrogen, do our dimensional analysis to get moles of nitrogen, moles of hydrogen. Hydrogen is three, nitrogen is one. Two times three is six. That's exactly what we get. How about in B? We have 3.1 moles of nitrogen and 10 of hydrogen. I'm going to plug 3.1 in here. 3.1 times 3 is what? 9.3. We need 9.3 moles of hydrogen. We have 10.2. So, what is limiting? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Now, this question had a second part. How many moles of our product can we make? A, one, two, three. We'll see. I, I haven't even done it in my head. Um, there are two ways we can do this. Remember, if I had noticed that it was asking me how many moles can be produced, I would have taken my two, figured out how many moles of ammonia I could make. Take my five, figure out how much product I could make. Whichever one be even the smallest one would be the limiting reactant. Okay? We didn't go that direction. We compared the reactants to the reactants. But we know now which one is limiting. In A it's hydrogen, in B it's nitrogen. So all we have to do is Say if this is limited, this five moles of hydrogen is limiting, the five moles of hydrogen is going to determine how much product we make. So we do stoichiometry to go from five moles of hydrogen to moles of ammonia. 
And can you do that in your head? Probably not. So we have 5.0 moles of hydrogen. How many are going to be here? Moles of NH3. My coefficient here is 2, coefficient here is 3, so it's 2 thirds of 5. That is how much NH3 I can make. What is 2 thirds of 5? 3 and 3rd? 2665. Wouldn't it take, wait, would the 66 only count on the 5.0 or would it technically be 166 because of the 2 and the 3? These, remember that, that lab we had, it was measured numbers and exact numbers? Exact, so exact numbers, numbers you don't count how many 66 there are. Okay. Right. So you just go with the, the, the 2. Because there's a two per gotcha. <coughs> yeah. two yeah. Here's another one. So this one I'm going to notice before I do the work that there's A and B. B is asking me how much product I can make. A is what is the limiting reactor. Anybody that wants to come do this? Is it just kind of the same thing? It's the same thing. So we're going to make 0.4 grams of aluminum with chlorine. I can try. Okay. I In we can start either way, right? So or are we starting from ABL to go to CEL, right? So what we're going to do, because we see that B wants amount of product, we're going to start take, from go from AL, AL to ALCL3, and then CL2 to ALCL3. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Three or CL3? ALCL3. And that is 
so aluminum is what, 27, chlorine is what, 35? One thirty-three point five. Is that right? You probably did it right. I was trying to think. One thirty-three point five. One thirty-three point five. Are you in here? Right. One thirty-three point five. We're we're both at the same time. We we'll just see. Yeah. One thirty-three point. You're, you're done. Okay. That's it. Okay. So then we do the math. Point four. Point two. One thirty-three point five. Two equals 1.98 grams ALCL3. Okay. So that is how many grams of ALCL3 we get from our aluminum. We then have to turn around and do the same exact thing with our 0 0.60 grams of chlorine. I'm just trying to see how I did my own work. I yeah. have no idea. So for A, I think you just say the ratio is 2 to 3 from A to CL, and 40 is 2 thirds of 60, therefore yes. they're equal. You, you can. If, if you can see that, you're perfectly mm -hmm. right. Sometimes it's not going to be that easy. And so what you need to do is what we're doing, calculate how much product you get from your aluminum, calculate how much product you get from your chlorine, whichever one gives you less is your limit. So, somebody want to do the second one? I'm going to just do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it underneath. Okay. So, we got 0 0.6, actually, it'd be easier to do it now. 0 0.60 yeah, I'm not sure. oh, sorry. grams of chlorine. And grams of chlorine, moles of chlorine. One mole of chlorine will weigh 71 grams. I get 0 0.75 grams ALCL3. And does that match what you did in your head? That the chlorine is limiting? So, yeah. <laughs> What's wrong? the same thing. Oh, no, it's right, it's right. So the same thing that got you got me. We were looking at, here this is being one and a half times as much chlorine as aluminum, right? But these are grams, not moles. Oh. So, I, I warned you earlier, and I made the mistake, these coefficients don't apply to grams, right? You 
have to figure out the moles before you can do that head math. Okay. So, the chlorine gives us 0.75 grams of product. The aluminum gives us 1.98 grams of product. So, what is your answer for A? Chlorine. 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 What is your answer for B? 1.98 grams of No, 0.75. Oh, yes. Right, the chlorine is limiting. You take the smallest one, that's how much you can make. 0.75 grams. How long can the I'm lost in the limiting. How long is the chlorine is going to something? It's whichever one makes the smallest amount. Oh, okay. Just like you should just ignore the grams. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go back to your, your pancake recipe. If you figure out you have enough eggs to make 16 pancakes, and you have enough flour to make eight pancakes, which which one is your limiting ingredient? Which one limits how much how many pancakes you can make? The flour. <laughs> right? Did I say that right? Yeah. Eggs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Less eggs or less flour? I don't know what's going on. Look, if that was happening at home, I would just go out and find a way to not make it at all. So, think back to when we were looking at the pieces of the, of the car. We said we had enough car bodies to make four, but only enough car wheels to make three. Okay. And so which means the wheels are the limiting reactant. Is, is this the last thing? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Percent yield is easy. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you can do a number divided by a number in your calculator, you can do percent yield. Oh, I don't think I'm going to You said a, num a number? A number. Numbers, huh? Numbers. That's confusing. You, you can't go, go 7.8 divided by cat. You have to go a number divided by a number. <laughs> when we do this stoichiometry to figure out how much product we can make, that is what we call a theoretical yield. In a perfect world, that's how much you could make. You're not going to get that much in real life. We'll talk about why in another, another day. But you will basically always get less than that theoretical yield. If you get more than the theoretical yield, you have contamination. Okay? That means there's something mixed in with your product that is not your product. And so what you do is you calculate a percent yield. It's basically how efficient is your process. If you're supposed to get 100 grams of product and you get 75 grams of product, you just take your 75 grams that you got divided by your theoretical times 100, and that's what, what percent of what you should have gotten did you get? Okay? Actual yield divided by theoretical yield. Experimental divided by what theoretical. Yeah? You already did something like this in the lab. Similar to this. We did percent error. So that, that was. But you did percent error, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it was your actual minus your theoretical to figure out the difference between them, okay. and then you divide it by your, your theoretical. This is just actual divided by theoretical. So like, you were supposed to get yield 10, and yield 5, 50, 50, 50 you got 50% yield. You made 50% of what you were supposed to make. Okay. And without trying to, to defend them, because that's a whole big political thing. But part of the reason a lot of drugs cost so much is because 
It may be a 50 step synthesis. It takes 50 reactions to go from what you're starting with to make the drug that you take. And if you lose 50% at every step, how much do you have to start with to make one little pill? Okay, That's part of the reason why drugs cost so much. That's not the only reason. We're not going to go there. But that is one reason. Imagine if even if you had 90% yield. Chemist's goal is to make 90% yield. That means you lose 10% every step. If you have 50 steps, you're still going to end up with very little compared to what, what you start with. Okay, But it's money. Because what co the cost of that pill is determined by how much cost what you started with costs. So if you can take one of your reactions and make it more efficient, you can save a lot of money in the long haul. And so chemical companies spend a lot of time and effort trying to make the reactions that they currently use more efficient because it will save them money. Okay. In this reaction, we have 0.2 moles of chlorine, and it's telling us we have more sodium than we could ever need. So this means that our chlorine is our limiting reactant, right? And it says we make 0.4 moles of sodium chloride. So the question is, what is our percent yield? So we need to we're given our actual yield. We need to calculate the theoretical yield, which is easy. So we're just going moles to moles. So what are we starting with here? 0.2 moles of chlorine, right? Does everyone see why 0.2 moles is our starting? 0.4 moles is our actual. So that comes out. We're saving that for later. And the only number we have left is 0.2 moles of chlorine. So we have 0.2 moles of chlorine. And we want to take it to here. Our actual is measured in moles of NaCl. So we need to calculate our theoretical in moles of NaCl, which is easy. We just do our mole ratio. Here it's 2. Here is 1. So what is our theoretical yield? Zero point four <coughs> moles of sodium chloride. Point two times two. So what is our percent yield? Hundred percent. Our theoretical was point four. We actually got point four. Point four divided by point four is one times a hundred is a hundred percent. she had, because I already did that math for you. It says that our theoretical yield is 8.95 grams. She weighed her product at the end as 7.44 grams. What was her actual yield? 7.44. Her actual yield is in grams, 7.44 grams. What was her theoretical yield? 8.95, which means she had a percent yield of what? 83%. 83%. Actual 7.44 divided by theoretical 8.95 equals what? 80, 83%. Yes. Yeah. 
So the way you see this a lot on quizzes and things is they give you a stoichiometry problem, make you calculate the theoretical, and then in part B it says if X amount was actually made, what is your percentage? And you'll still see that on the homework. I have one like that. Okay. Any questions? This wasn't too bad, was it? Could have been worse. I haven't even.